good Sunday morning coming to you from one of my fake backdrops. Again, don't mind this palm tree. It's very, very fake. I assure you of that. It's Mike here for you. And just like always, we like to say hello to our band of angels down there. Hi, Kim. How you doing? Kim's going to be leading the singing out there. If you're, if you're like me, virtually watching, you can go ahead and sing along. But if you are in church, we just ask you to use that inner voice and use your mask when entering and exiting. Also, if you'd like to get your prayer requests in, no better way than using the connection card. It also lets everybody know you've been here and your prayer requests will go directly to Pastor William. Just a reminder, again, one of my favorite things going on for you, it is grandparents out there. We're doing Comprez Adopt a Grandparent. So if you'd like to be involved, Grandparents Day is September 13th. We're going to be celebrating all the grandmas and grandpas out there dancing on down. So congratulations, grandparents, as we celebrate you. And again, Grandparents, I'm looking for an adoption, so you can look for me. Um, Comprez Preschool T-shirts. Now, this is going to be a great fundraiser to help the kids coming back to school for our preschool. Make sure you get one of those T-shirts. Not only are they cool T-shirts, but you'll be able to help out as well. The Churchwide Book Study is kicking off September 13th as well. So it's The God I Never Knew by Robert Morris. It's going to be churchwide, and that's also going to be September 13th. So keep that date in mind for a lot going on at Comprez. Um, and finally, today's sermon is going to be a special one. Uh, from your living room to Jesus's living room. It's brought to you by Pastor William. Pastor William's ready to kick that off. And also, most importantly, uh, if you're at home virtually, this is your chance to give. You can go to the website and click the Give button. You can also uh, text your donation. You can do it, text it right to this number right here. And also, you can mail it in. That's right. How you doing? We're going to be opening soon. Hey, my, my name is Scott Light. Hey, Scott. Good morning, friends. Thank you for inviting us into your homes. We are ready to worship the Lord. I'm actually reading the Bible verse in 2 Chronicles where it states, Seek and you will find. <clears throat> and, and so we're going to seek and find out some of the gems that the Lord has in store for, for each one of us. And my prayer for you this week is truly that as we're rolling through August, that God is rolling through your head and your heart, that he has some momentum in your life and things that you're dealing with, you're just handing over and watch him take something that needs to go and replace it with his presence and his promises, his power, his spirit. I mean, God has an agenda for your life and it is good for you and good through you for other people. And so may the Lord truly rest upon you personally, fill your household, your finances, your family, your home, your dreams, everything about your life. May the Lord have a grip of grace upon it. Well, <clears throat> I want to thank everybody who's been empowering our ministry financially. We've been having some fun moments. Uh, we're watching the Lord move in people's lives, um, having a couple people give their life to Jesus Christ. And so that, that's always the ultimate experience when people say, wow, I, I heard your message. I'm changing the direction of my life. I'm now going to be a Christ follower. And so uh, that's happened uh, that I'm aware of a couple of times. And so I'm really anticipating that as you and I team up, that this is going to continue to happen more and more. And not only is it people giving their lives to Jesus, there's a whole bunch of folks that are growing and being transformed. And so what I'm anticipating is this, that when you and I give to the kingdom of God, well, guess what's going to happen? He's going to keep giving to you. And I don't just mean financially. He gives you peace. He gives you joy. He gives you answered prayers. He gives you the ability to step forward and, and accomplish goals that have always eluded you, to attain dreams that you've always wanted. Um, the Lord is on the move, and it's happening in you. It's happening through you. And I just want to thank you for the way you empower the church. So God bless you. and. Let's just see all the more that God wants to do within and around us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
There's no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come with me in the space between all the things I've seen and this reckoning. I know I will never be. So today's message comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Well, we've been rolling through many of the emotions that, that we experience, especially during this COVID season. And today we're going to come to an awkward one, anger. I'm going to talk about spiritual anger management. You know, there was this young girl and she was writing a paper and she asked her dad, "Uh, Father, what's the difference between uh, anger and exasperation? And he says, it's basically the degree. I'll give you an example. And he goes to the phone and he hits a random number and he calls this person, says, hello, hi, is Melvin there? And the guy gets really angry. You know, there's nobody here by the name Melvin. You should be more careful and look the numbers up before you dial them and hangs up. And so the guy looks at his daughter and says, see, now this man's probably very busy and he's annoyed that we interrupted his day and so uh, he's not happy. Now watch this. Hits redial on the phone. Uh, Guy picks it up. Hello. He goes, hi, I was looking for Melvin. You already called, and I already told you there's no Melvin here. You have a lot of guts calling this number again, and slams the phone down. Says, see, daughter, now this would be anger. Now watch this. I'll show you what exasperation looks like. Hits the redial again. The guy picks up the phone. Oh! He goes, hi, this is Melvin. I was just curious. Uh, if you have any calls come in for me today? Well, most of us get angry at some point or another. If you're a California driver like me, when somebody's driving slow in the fast lane, it tends to make you angry. Or you spot that place you're going to park your car at the Publix, and somebody else sneaks in and grabs it. The paper jams and the copier right when you need it. 
we all start to get a bit of an attitude. And actually, there seems to be an epidemic of anger lately. You know, we've got a big controversy going on about wearing masks. We got the political machine and the big vote coming up in, you know, what, 60, 70 days, and there's a lot of conversation or rhetoric going back, and people are getting angry at each other on, on the other sides of the, the political divide. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I get a little frustrated when facts are being presented on Facebook and it gets. Uh, attacking, you know, little old ladies or breaking into cancer patients' rooms in the hospitals. Uh, you get angry about this kind of stuff. And some people just live in a constant state of anger. <clears throat> in fact, their face seems to have a permanent scowl. <laughs> you wonder if there's a smoldering volcano within them. Uh, I saw Molly the other day, and I said, Molly, what are you mad about? And she says, I'm not mad. This is my resting face. I'm like, oh yeah, I know that one. <laughs> My kids are always saying, Dad, what are you mad about? I'm not mad. Why are you asking me that? Well, you look mad. Uh, no, it's just the way I look. You know, actually, it's kind of sad. I was a happy little boy, and I grew up in a bad neighborhood, and if you were a happy little boy in a bad neighborhood, you got beat up a lot, and so you learned how to put a scowl on and be ready for a fight, and sadly, that becomes your persona, and your smile gets turned upside down to a frown. And I guess the real question is this, is it ever okay to get angry? <clears throat> Well, actually, Jesus got angry on numerous occasions. In Mark chapter 3, there was a man in worship with a withered hand. And it says that the religious leaders were watching him to see if he was going to heal this man's hand. You see, while Jesus never broke any of the Old Testament laws, he would break the religious leaders' laws because, well, actually, they were not in line with the heart of God. For instance, nobody's allowed to heal on a Sunday. Now, I doubt that there was a lot of people going around healing anybody anyways, but they'd figured out if you could heal somebody and it happens on a Sunday, that would be a sin. And Jesus was angry at their hardness of heart because they cared more about their rules than about restoring somebody who, who needed a touch from God. There was another time in Mark chapter 10 when moms were bringing their children to Jesus and the disciples are shooing them away. You know, Jesus is too busy to waste time on children. Jesus is for big people. And it says that Jesus was displeased. Let the little children come to me. And the word for displeased in the Greek means strong personal pain. How dare you? It's the strongest word of anger. When you keep children away from Jesus, he got furious. There was another time Jesus gets furious. In John chapter 2, he goes into the temple, and he chases out the money changers with a whip, turning the tables over. You could imagine the coins going flying all over the floor of the temple. And he says, this is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of robbers. You see, basically, they were extorting people who were coming to receive the forgiveness of the Lord. And so we can see from Jesus that there are times to get angry. You and I, we come across human trafficking issues. We see uh, racial injustice going on. Um, when people are calling good evil and redefining you know, good as an evil thing and, and saying evil is good. This is an opportunity for you and I to get upset and angry and frustrated. And actually, anger is a, a gift from God. It, it can give us insight into what's important. It, it's a catalyst. Actually, our blood starts pumping and our eyes get focused and our nose widens so that we can get more air into our systems. The adrenaline starts to flow and, and it motivates us to do something about the wrong that we encounter. But our passage in Ephesians says, be angry, okay, but do not sin. Did you hear that? Be angry. There's times to get angry. Um, <clears throat> in fact, it was said to me that depression turned inward is anger. 
okay? You know, depression is anger turned inward is the better way to state it. And, and basically what that means is if you don't allow outlets for your anger, if you don't have a way to process the things that have gone on in your life, if you're always stuffing things down, well, this is not going to go good for your health, and it's not going to go good for your mental health. You know, high blood pressure, uh, stomach problems, heart disease, anxiety, and depression happen to us when we don't properly process our anger. This one Christian woman was told that her husband was killed in a drowning accident, and her response was, praise the Lord. And you go, wait a minute, either she didn't really like him, or she has a high um, insurance policy taken out on him. Uh, actually, neither. She loved her husband. They were both deep Christians. And so she went to her immediate theological application, praise God, my husband is now with the Jesus that he loves. The problem with that statement is, there needs to be some kind of emotional expression because if you don't properly, you know, release your grief, ah, it takes its toll on the inside of your body and soul. And however, blowing up, be angry, yes, but do not sin. Blowing up, this is not the right way to do it. We've all hit the email send button when we shouldn't have. Okay, we've all released our feelings, our frustrating feelings on, on the phone call when we probably shouldn't. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, you remember in Seinfeld, George Costanza's father? <laughs> this guy was a rageaholic. It, it would be one statement, two statements, and he was raging. And, and we got a lot of people that are raging right now. Maybe they use their anger to, to control others and get their way. Uh, I was reading about the researchers at the University of Chicago Hospitals, the psychiatry department. They had done a study on anger, and they... They gave it a new term. Um, <clears throat> it's called ex intermittent explosive disorder. So when you get angry, you might have intermittent explosive disorder. See, now we can blame our bad behavior on a disorder rather than a lack of control. And, you know, the problem is for, for their study is they were looking for angry people to, to put through a testing system and nobody was willing to admit that they had a problem with anger. And if you were going to say that you did, they might give you a punch. Who are you to say that I'm angry? And, and, and here's the deal. They tried to fix it with a pill, a drug. Um, it was called Depecote. De Okay, and, and here's what I'm going to suggest. When Jesus finds us in an angry situation, he doesn't say take a chill pill. Actually, he says, let's take a look at your heart. You know, there's a time in Matthew chapter 6 when Jesus actually addresses um, the commandment to murder. And he says, it has been said, don't murder, but I'm saying don't even get angry. <clears throat> Okay, it's not just about your actions. I want to go down beneath your actions to the heart of the matter, which actually is your heart. Okay, um, Jesus goes deeper into the crevices of our minds and our lives to address the core of our lives. You see, it's at the core of our being where sin has damaged us. And so Jesus comes down to the core beyond the actions to the reactions within us that cause us to behave the way we do. Jesus wants to go down and heal us down in the levels of our soul so that we live with a different attitude and mindset. You know, and here's why it's important. <clears throat> because wrong actions start with wrong attitudes. Okay, the devil loves to come in and plant seeds of anger within each one of us. And then he takes a hurt and he nurses it into hatred. And now you might have been frustrated with somebody or they might have an ongoing you know, quirk that gets on your nerves. And, and if you allow Satan the opportunity, he's gonna turn that frustration into a hatred and it's gonna be a relationship destroyer and he's gonna start to control you. And so Jesus goes, whoa, before you murder that person, 
let's take a peek at the, the thoughts going on in your head. You know, I read that if you sow a thought, you reap an act. If you sow an act, you reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you reap a character. You sow a character, you reap a destiny. And so you can see why it's important to grab a hold of certain parts of our lives and go, wait a minute, I don't want to be a rageaholic. I want to grab a hold of this before it shapes my character and determines my destiny. In fact, Jesus says the things that come out of our mouth, they come from the heart, okay? And, And friends, having a pure heart is much more difficult than having pure actions. You know, many of us, we can control our outward actions, And you see somebody who's cool hand Luke on the outside, but if you had a peek on the inside, you'd realize, oh my goodness, they're not cool. They're full of hatred and rage and attitude and cynicism, you know, and and they can treat you like they love you while they're actually demeaning you in, in their minds and thinking negative thoughts about you, even wishing that you were dead. And when we wear a mask like this as Christians, the Lord says, no. I don't want you to pretend to care about people and be nice to people. I actually want you from the heart to love them. Wow, check this out. You got to stop despising people that you're angry with and realize this individual is somebody that Jesus wants me not to get mad at, but to extend grace and love towards. Again, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And I just want to stop right here and ask, is anybody nursing a grudge? Has anybody got a rotten attitude towards somebody? Is anybody harboring anger or in the grip of bitterness? Because if you are, if there's somebody that you're unwilling to forgive, Jesus is saying, listen, let's talk about this anger problem right now. Because it's not healthy for you. And it's really not the way you and I live as we go through life as Christians. Um, As you know, I've heard that when a rattlesnake gets cornered, it can get so frenzied that it'll accidentally bite itself with its deadly poison. And I bring this up because that's what happens to you and I when we release anger on people. We accidentally bite ourselves. We accidentally hurt our, our, our own souls. Um, you know, we're thinking that we're going to let that person have it with our words, but actually, you know, the harm is inflicted upon ourselves. And, and the real harm is it interferes with our relationship with God. You know, when Leonardo da Vinci was painting The Last Supper, <clears throat> he got in an argument with another painter, and he got so angry with that painter that he went into his studio and he put that painter's face on Judas, <laughs> okay? And everybody around knew that person was Judas and put it right there out for everybody to see. Well, Leonardo goes forward and he's finishing off the painting and one of the last things he does is he wants to paint the face of Christ. But he can't get it right. Tried and tried and he can't get it right and finally he realized the problem was he put the face of somebody he was angry with on Judas. So he had to redo Judas's face so that it was some anonymous person. And as soon as he did that, he was able to then paint the face of Jesus. And I love this because it's hard for us to see Jesus when we're not willing to see Jesus in other people. You have to realize they've been made in his image The Lord created them in his image. Jesus died for them because they're that valuable to him. And he wants you and I to put our anger aside and see people through his eyes. And basically, anger is a devaluation of the worth of another person. Okay, and you need to ask yourself, like James, how is it that you curse those made in the image of God? We're not supposed to do that. Or how can you say in 1 John, you love God and yet hate your brother? It doesn't work. Biblically, it does not compute. And we need to handle our anger because a right relationship with God can never be separated from a right relationship with other people. They're inexplicably linked. Okay? 
Um, and, and, and here's how it works for you and me. You get into a tiff with somebody, and Romans 12 tells us, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with other people. So, <clears throat> that person that you're not at peace with, this person that you haven't forgiven, this other person that you just are starting to quarrel with, guess what? As far as it comes down to you, you need to extend peace. Extend forgiveness. Decide not to pay back evil for evil, but evil for good. And, and you know where this happens? It's when you and I end the day and we lay out in our prayer life. What happened? You can almost see the Lord going on. So what happened in your day? You're going, well, <clears throat> so-and-so really got me mad. And, I'm, and suddenly, as you realize so-and-so, you process them differently. You process them through the lens of grace. Suddenly now, Jesus has entered into your heart and he's changed your perspective. And, and this is so important. And, and I just have some bad news for you. Um, <clears throat> when that surge of anger comes, you and I, we have to say, wait a minute, this is somebody who's an object of God's grace and I'm the avenue to bring God's grace to them. Friends, this isn't an optional activity, okay? Um, <clears throat> this is an obligation that you and I have. Uh, we need to look for opportunities and put ourselves aside so that Jesus comes through us. You can't be passive about ruined relationships. You've got to be intentionally proactive. And the reason why is because reconciliation is the heartbeat of Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what sent him to the cross. And that's what we're called to be like him. You know, when Judas came to betray him, he says, do what you've come for, friend. When Malchus goes to arrest him and Peter chops off his ear, he heals him. He doesn't go, you got what you deserve. You see how the Lord operates? He extends grace and love to the people that are doing them wrong. Again, Paul says, make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always be kind to each other and to everyone. This is in 1 Thessalonians 5.15. And really, friends, when you and I decide to release kindness and, and, and forego anger, the Holy Spirit comes alive in a fresh new way. We got somebody, he's called the helper, helping us out with the way to handle somebody, guiding us with the right attitude, aiming us at reconciliation. It's supernatural power is available to you. And by the way, the Lord says, <clears throat> don't, don't get your own vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And you might go, good. Because I want so-and-so to get what they deserve. And I, I just want to let you know, don't be upset if the Lord decides to extend them the same kind of grace that he's extended to you and me. All right? That's the way we need to think. And, and for some of us, we might think, well, you know, anger is just a small little thing. But for Jesus, anger is a big deal. Okay? In fact, giving place to anger and bitterness, it's a sin. And according to Matthew chapter 6, that sends you liable for the judgment. He says, I tell you, if anyone's angry with his brother, you're subject to the judgment. If anybody says empty head to his brother or, or says you fool, you are in danger of the fires of hell. And you go, wait a minute. I say that to people all the time. I think that about people all the time. Uh, the, you know, to think that somebody's worthless or stupid, the term for fool, it, it's moron. It's where we get the word moron from. It, it, it's a, a degenerate, a deviant. And, and here's the problem. You and I could be driving down the road and somebody does a traffic move that we don't like and we go, there's an idiot, okay? Boom. And it's in the privacy of the car. Nobody knows. But actually, you're never alone. You got somebody traveling with you. It's the Lord God. Okay? And he wants us to see that that bad driver, you know, he, he loves them. Jesus died for them. He has a plan for their life. And maybe instead of saying, you idiot, we say, wow, 
I gotta pray for this person. I wonder what's going on in their head so that they're distracted. I wonder why they're not a good driver. I wonder if they got some issues that I can ask God to move into that car and bless that person. Because I'm telling you, as soon as you start driving that way, you know, a road rage dissipates because the Spirit of God has now taken over the steering wheel of your life. And when you and I get into arguments with people, you know, I'll ask folks, so do you go for the throat? And a lot of people say, yes, I do. And I'm like, well, you, you realize that you're forever damaging a relationship. This one cool move happened the other day. This guy got all upset about a situation with his dad, and he writes a scathing letter, and he, he gives it to his, his partner and says, send it. And he goes, man, you don't want to send that letter. He goes, send that letter. So he goes, all right. So he takes the letter, and he doesn't send it. He puts it into his, his uh, pocket. <clears throat> And the next day, his partner comes back and goes, man, I can't believe I sent that letter. I'd give $100 to have it back. This is going to break my father's heart. Guy pulls out the letter. I didn't send it. Give me the $100. <laughs> okay. You know, how often do we release emotions that we didn't interpret and translate spiritually, and we end up destroying relationships? Furthermore, I mean, we're doing this right now in the political fight. We're doing this with social, racial, educational, and economic groups. Friends, this is what Luke Dickwid of, of the Society of St. John, the evangelist in Boston says. We brothers say, the person who most gets under your skin in the community has a special role to play. That one is your teacher. Often what annoys us in another relates to something in ourselves. And uncomfortably, he or she is the one whom you especially need on the bus. Because we all belong to one big, messy family. So, <clears throat> I got problems, they got problems, what's-her-face has quirks. All of us together need grace. And when somebody does a misstep, says the wrong thing, is having a bad day, we can respond with anger or we can respond with the character and the ideals of Jesus Christ. And, and here's the problem with anger. It does not have forgiveness and reconciliation as the goal. It's about getting even with somebody, setting them straight, settling the score. It's all about me making sure that my rights are not infringed upon and that you understand that I'm to be respected. I'm a serious somebody. Well, actually, according to Galatians 2, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. There's no longer any more you. When you start walking with Jesus, you give the reins of your life over. He changes the way you think. He transforms the drives of your life. He alters the way you handle situations. And so now you're under the control of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And for me, when I start to get angry, I remember, you know what? <clears throat> it's not about me. I need to see this person through the eyes of the Lord. And when the Bible says, do not give the devil a foothold, here's the truth. When you go to anger and you start nursing it, you're allowing Satan to set up shop in your soul. You're giving him control and permitting anger in your life that's going to be a prison that you might never get out of. Do you know how often I've heard, I will never forgive this person? And the moment somebody shares that, I say, well, you're never going to go forward in your relationship with Jesus until you address this. And, and that's the fact of the matter. Jesus usually comes to that place, that moment, that person, and says, this is the problem between you and me. And we have to surrender it. And, and I want to say this, learning to forgive can be the most freeing thing that will ever happen to you. You know, there was a woman named Amy Beale. She was a 26-year-old Fulbright scholar who had gone to South Africa to help register black voters for their first free election. And here she was trying to seek to help 
the people of South Africa, and one day as she's driving in her car, her car gets stopped, she gets dragged out and beaten to death. Well, she's beaten to death by the people that she had come to serve and, and empower and, and, and transform their lives. Well, her parents, Linda and Peter Bale, they hear this news, and soon after they quit their jobs in, in, in Orange County, California, they move out of their home to South Africa, not to seek revenge, but to start a foundation in Amy's name. And get a load of this. Two of her killers now work for her, Amy's parents, in this whole reconciliation foundation. In fact, they call Mrs. Beale grandmother because of the way she treats them. And friends, this is what grandmother says. Forgiving is looking at ourselves and saying, I don't want to go through life feeling hateful and revengeful because that's not going to do me any good. We took Amy's lead and we did what we felt she would want us to do. I don't know about you, but if somebody pulled your child out of the car and just beat and stabbed them to death, that would make me angry. But it takes maturity to say, okay, Let's, let's take a look deeper. And actually, as Christians, <clears throat> it's not only that we forgive somebody, that we reach out and restore them. Okay? It's following the heart and character of Jesus Christ. And when I say the heart and character, listen to 2 Corinthians 5. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was in the world reconciling everybody to himself through Jesus. Not counting people's transgressions against them. And he's committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. So in other words, when you and I go into life in the day in, day out, practical world or the big issues when a serious offense has happened, our goal is not to think about me, but to think about how I might reconcile, how my, I might extend grace, how I might release upon the people around me, the people offending me, a vision of who Jesus Christ is. Because at the end of the day, I'm so grateful that God forgo his anger towards my sinfulness pushed it aside, and found an avenue of reconciliation to bring me into relationship with him. And he's asking us to go out and bring everybody possible into a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, it's a powerful moment. <clears throat> Jesus says, when you go to the altar and you remember somebody's got something against you, Lay your gift at the foot of the altar. Don't put it on the altar. Before you reconcile with me, go and reconcile with somebody else. And to be honest, I thought about it a couple people that <clears throat> I'm going to have to go reach out to. Say, hey, I know you got a problem with me, and um, I'm just here to apologize. I'm just here to say, hey, what can I do to make this right? I'm just here to say, you know what? I actually love you, and I love the Lord, and I know you love the Lord, and so we're supposed to work this out. So I got an assignment to carry out this week, <clears throat> and I, I'm going to invite you to allow the Lord into your head and your heart, and, and take that impulse to get angry, to get upset, to get frustrated, and some of us let it roll out too far. You know, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Soon as it starts rolling, grab it and say, no, this doesn't work for my soul. This doesn't please the Lord. This is only going to destroy relationships. Because God promises, you know, you seek first the kingdom of God and all these things are going to be added unto you. All the things you're worried about, struggling against, upset with, He's got you covered. You're his daughter and son. So why don't you get busy with the family business? And let's just love, reconcile, forgive, and show his grace. 
May the power of the Holy Spirit release this new atmosphere within you and through you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. In today's fast-moving world, smartphones are integrated into our lives. We bank and shop on our smartphones, and many of us want to give with them too. Giving to the church with a text message is fast, easy, and versatile. With Give Plus Text, you can make a weekly offering or respond to a special appeal in just seconds. To give, you enter the church's 10-digit Give Plus Text number and the amount you wish to donate. Then, send your text. The first time you contribute with Give Plus Text, you'll receive a secure registration link. Click the link to go to our secure website where you'll enter your contact and payment information. Tap Process when you're done. After you've completed your registration, a text reply will verify that your gift has been received. We'll also email you a receipt. For future giving, you simply send a text with the amount you wish to give and it will process automatically. You can also choose to make your gift recurring. Give Plus Text is that easy. Register, give, repeat. Call or visit the church office to ask about Give Plus Text and the other electronic giving options we offer.